All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Inside Writing. This show is presented by Gotham Writers, offering writing classes of all types and sizes. You can visit us at GothamWriters.com. Before we get started, a few announcements, and we have a new announcement today. So right on time for the subject matter of today's episode, the Gotham Writers Conference is officially open for registration. If you want a peek behind the publishing curtain, this is the place to be. Doubly so if you have a project you're ready to discuss with agents. Registration is open on the Gotham website as well as on Gotham's Twitter. There's a link there, so check it out. Uh, okay, regarding today's episode, again, at any point in the show, you can use the Q&A function to ask questions of our panelists. Most of you are familiar with Zoom, but if you're not on the bottom toolbar there, you'll see a chat and you'll also see Q&A. So chat is there just for general discussion. If you have you know, something you want to weigh in on, go ahead and do that in the chat. And then any questions you want to ask of the panelists during the Q&A portion, you'll do that in the Q&A. So keep discussion and chat, keep your questions in Q&A. Uh, also, if you want to get caught up on any episodes of Inside Writing from season one or two or our current season, season three, you can find them all on the Gotham Writers YouTube channel or on any major podcasting platform. And while you're there, like us, subscribe, uh, subscribe to us, leave a review. It helps to spread the word. Now, on to the subject matter of the day. We're going to be talking about writing conferences and writing retreats. So let's jump right in and meet our panelists. Our, our first panelist author of the book, How to Sit, as well as pieces appearing in The Offing, Catapult, BuzzFeed, The Rumpus, Lost Balloon, and more. Also noted in Best American Essays and the Pushcart Anthology, Tyrese Coleman. Hello, Tyrese. Hi, everybody. Hi there, thank you for being here. And our second panelist, author of the books, Howard and Charles at the Factory, This Darkness Got to Give, Massive Cleansing Fire and more, as well as a founding editor of Barrel House, Dave Housley. Hello, Dave. Hi, everybody. Hey, Josh. Hey there, Dave. All right, so we're going to start with the, the first part of our discussion is going to be about conferences, and then we're going to transition into retreats later. But Dave, I want to start with you with a simple enough question. What is the point of attending a writing conference? Why should writers go? I think there are lots of different opportunities. And I, I know people come to our conference for lots of different things. Um, usually we're in person. So, you know, we usually do our conference in um, the spring in Washington, D.C., in the fall in Pittsburgh. And I think for people in those regions, it's a really good opportunity to meet, you know, other people to kind of get acquainted with some folks that are generally in the writing community. And we will have some people come in from you know, pretty far away for those in-person events. But generally, you're going to see the, the editors and other writers who are kind of in your local community. Um, I think community is a big reason to do that, um, to kind of get recharged, because writing is so weird. You know, you sit off in your little space. I'm sitting in my writing space right now, which is also my workspace, which is also 10 feet from my bedroom. So, um, you know, it's a great opportunity to go kind of, get recharged and connect with some other people to commiserate. Um, also to, to work on your craft and to, to go hear people who really know what they're doing, talk about areas that you're interested in, whether that's editors or other writers. Um, so I think those are really the, the two things that come to mind initially. Therese, what about you? What, what makes you go to a conference? Um, for me, I like going to conferences to, uh, one, to basically see my friends, <laughs> the people I haven't seen in, I don't know, forever. Um, people I haven't seen probably since the last conference, um, which is a little bit harder to do, you know, in the current sort of climate that we're in. Um, but uh, in the past was very something that I, I looked forward to. Um, in terms of, um, you know, craft and, and things of that nature. I actually really enjoy conferences when they introduce me to people I haven't heard of. So, um, you know, books and readings and other literary type events that um, expose me to people who kind of blow my mind and um, that I'm a little bit, you know, just kind of awed with. Uh, I love when that happens. Um, and then also I've gone to conferences um, to learn. I, I don't think that there's at any point in any writer's career where they 
can ever stop learning new things, learning about craft, learning about themselves. So those are really the reasons why I enjoy conferences um, and uh, wish that I could do more. Hopefully in the future, we can go back to some in person. So then to, to, to riff off of that, Tyrese, for somebody that's never been to a conference, how do you, pre do you prepare for a conference or do you just wait for the date and show up or how do you, how do you prepare for it? Do you schedule your day out or, or what's your approach? Yeah, I actually am the type of person who will schedule my day out. Um, I appreciate when conferences have the schedule available online prior to, um, you know, people, uh, people's arrival. So then I can plan sort of which um, panels I want to attend, um, sort of plot out my day. Obviously, you know, sometimes things will go in a different direction. Um, but for the most part, I will, you know, go through the pamphlet or go through their online scheduler and click the things that I know I definitely want to go to. Um, and then if I get, if I hear about something else, but I always have an alternative plan. So if I hear about, you know, something that's going on in another room or another panel that seems to be a little bit more along my interests, then I will switch, but I am definitely a planner for sure. Dave, what about you? How, how can you, how can writers best maximize their getting their money's worth, especially if they're traveling for a conference, how can they prepare themselves? I think it is a good idea to, to kind of look at the panels and presentations that are going to be happening and try to really hone in on what might be best for you. Um, because I kind of participate in, in developing our like program, um, I always hear from people, I'm having a really hard time choosing between this or this, and I can only go to one thing in this chosen time. So I always say, like, look and see what's going to be best for you. What are you going to find out? that you're going to be able to walk out of that session and be able to apply to your own writing, whether that's you're having trouble figuring out where to submit or you're having trouble, you know, working on something in a specific genre or finishing a story or something like that. Um, I always tell people to look for something that's going to be really useful to them. Like depending on where you are in your writing career, you may not need to know how to negotiate the film rights for your novel. Right. But you might need to know like how the hell did someone finish a novel? Like, so choose the thing that you're going to be able to take away. And it does, it does help to, uh, to look at who's going to be presenting, um, you know, try to find something you connect with and a, a writer who maybe you think, Oh, that's, they're writing the kind of stuff I am, but they're further along in their career. Maybe I could, I could learn something from that person. So I think it is worthwhile doing that research, especially if you're going to be traveling and depending on what it costs. Um, ours is pretty cheap, but I know, it's pretty wide range. Um, I would also tell people not to feel like there's some kind of pressure on them. I think sometimes people feel like, especially if you're showing up for an in-person event, kind of intimidated because there are all these people here you, you might think are, are really accomplished and who might be kind of judgy. Um, writers and writers conferences have a kind of bad reputation for being pretentious spaces. So, we always try, I'm sure you do the same, Josh, to make sure that our space is as welcoming as possible. So those people who are new to writing won't feel like they're kind of entering into this really scary space and they have to get themselves all psyched up for it. So I wouldn't want to give people the impression that they need to get all psyched up in order to, to enter into this space because it should be a welcome opening space for kind of all you know, writers at, at any level, really. And Dave, it's, it's kind of funny because if you go out there and you look at these, there's all these like survival lists of how to make it through a conference. You have to stay yeah. <laughs> hydrated. You have to get granola bars. Do you buy into that? Do, do you have to like have a survival pack to make it through a conference? Is it, is it that high energy? <laughs> I don't think so. That's, that's again, why I, I kind of want to tell people not to psych themselves out too much and not to worry too much about you know, like first day of school kind of thing where you're going to be getting judged. Um, you know, a lot of us are at the same place. And I know at our conference, we try to make sure it's very welcoming. I know at AWP, I see a lot of these lists of people, you know, like, remember to drink water, um, which is certainly good advice. 
but um, I mean, my advice would be like, just don't, don't psych yourself out that much. This isn't that big a deal. And people are most likely going to be kind of friendly and welcoming and kind, no matter where you are in your kind of writing career. Um, mm -hmm. You know, physically, you, if you're going somewhere for a day, you probably do want to make sure they have food and water or have a plan to bring your own. We always tell people like in our in-person conference, if you're the kind of person who's really going to be angry, if you don't have a specific kind of coffee, you should probably bring that with you. Like take care of yourself in that way. But again, like I, I kind of subscribe to the, like, don't get yourself too psyched, or psyched out over this. It's going to be, it's probably going to be fine. Tyrese, anything to add to that? Do you have a survival go kit for every conference? I don't. Um, other than my laptop and something to um, write my comments on uh, or like my notes or whatever, um, I usually just arrive with actually as little as possible. If it's if especially if it's a day conference, like if it's something that I'm just going to for the day, um, I will just bring a bag that has something for me to write on my purse and all my, you know, monies and everything um, and pens or whatever. And then also have, um, you know, if, if I am a writer, I'm a person who likes to write my notes by hand. So, but I think if I were the type who took, you know, dictated notes or typed or something, I would bring like, you know, a tablet or something or use my phone. But, um, but other than that, I, I think it's best if you just kind of keep it light. Um, like I said, especially if it's a day conference, because you're also going to be given multiple materials. Usually when you go to a conference, there's going to be some type of swag. You're going to get like a, a canvas bag with the um, materials for the day and the, the schedule. And you're also going to get like a folder that'll probably have like some coupons or flyers or something in it. So, um, you know, you don't want to already go to the conference with a bunch of stuff. And then when you get there, get a whole bunch of other stuff. So I try and just kind of keep it as simple as possible. I also go, uh, and this is just um, me and my preferences. I like to go to conferences that have like drinks and food <laughs> and stuff like that already available. Um, so I don't have to like bring my own like little snacks or whatever. So um, just kind of, you know, think about what is available at the conference that you're going to, um, because you may not necessarily need to bring all that survival kit stuff. Um, but I agree with what Dave said. If there's a particular type of thing that you want and need, just bring it along with you. Uh, nobody's going to look at you strangely. In fact, someone probably will ask you if they can have some of it. <laughs> so just kind of, you know, um, don't be afraid to kind of take care of yourself um, in whatever ways you normally do when you're at home. So Tyrese, big question here, but do you feel like going to conferences has benefited your writing career, either in, in fostering creativity or in meeting the right people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, the first conference I went to was Barrel House's conference. Like when I was still in, un, I'm not an undergrad, when I was still in my writing program. Um, and uh, I remember it very vividly. I remember like getting feedback um, at the, uh, from one of the editors there I remember like, you know, being really inspired by um, the, the writers that I saw during like, there was like a writer's panel um, that was like the keynote that year. And, um, you know, being inspired by the people who were talking about their books. Um, and it, was, it came along really at the right time in my writing career because it was, just around the time where I started learning about submitting things, learning about um, publishing um, and what literary magazines were, um, and also the different sort of levels of publishing. You know, when you, before you start really getting into the scene, you have, you know, at least for me, I had no idea how a book became a book. 
or how, you know, or how one actually published a book. So, um, so going to the Barrel House um, conversations and connections when I was in my writing program was essential in sort of, you know, setting some groundwork in terms of understanding those things. And then um, I'd say after my book came out, um, going to AWP was also a very crucial moment in my career because um, that AWP, I had so many readings, so many uh, opportunities to put my face forward. So it was more of a marketing um, perspective at that point in time because I had something to market. Um, and I made, I met a bunch of people, AWP is Association of Writers and Writing Programs. And so they have a large conference, uh, nation, a conference that takes place in different cities throughout the country once every year. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a huge conference that includes, um, booksellers as well as authors and panels and things like that. And so, you know, generally speaking, when you have a book uh, and you're looking to promote it, you'll do like readings, you'll do other sort of promotional things at AWP to sort of get your name out there. And that was a very crucial moment for me in my writing career as well. So it, I think it really depends on the conference and it depends on where you're at when, with your writing. Dave, what about you? How has conference going affected your writing career or has it? Pretty much the same. I think, you know, since I'm on the organizing side of our conference, I've been able to make a lot of contacts that way because I'm just reaching out to editors and writers all the time. Um, I had kind of the same experience at AWP, both from I'm an editor and a writer side that if when I've had books coming out and they've been kind of been able to schedule some events at AWP or other conferences as well, it, it definitely does kind of boost your stock a little bit and you can sell some books, feel like you can get some momentum going. Um, as an editor, when we've had authors, uh, Barrel House also is small press. We put out about two books a year. Uh, and when we've had authors and have been able to promote their event or their books at AWP, especially when we're able to kind of connect with some larger presses, um, we've definitely seen really good results from that. So I think that's, that's a really good point that you can do some kind of promotion at conferences when you have a book coming out. And it, like I said, I'm organizing our conference, but I, I tend to gravitate towards like craft workshop type of kind of presentations where someone's honing in on a specific thing like dialogue or how to begin the story or how setting works in short fiction. I feel like those are the kinds of things I generally attend at our conference when I'm not, you know, running around setting up chairs or something like that, which is the glamorous work of conference <laughs> organizing. It's mostly setting up chairs and putting up signs with duct tape. Um, but those kind of craft things, I feel like are the kind of things I tend to gravitate towards because I do feel like I'm gonna walk out of this with, with some ideas and some approaches that I can, I can go sit down over lunch and start applying them to the story that I'm trying to finish that's not working. So that's the kind of thing that as a writer, I tend to look for most. And then, you know, I, I try not to talk about the pandemic too much on the show, but it, it is extra relevant to our subject today. So Dave, I'm curious, do you feel like conferences still have value being virtual or, or, or how has the pandemic affected the conference landscape? It's definitely affected it. Um, we canceled two conferences, and two retreats. Um, but we did have a virtual version of our conference in February. Um, probably should have done it much sooner, but despite the fact that my real job is, is doing web strategy for Penn State, I kind of froze up and was like, I just don't see it. I, I, I don't see how we can kind of take this and translate it. As it turned out, it, it was pretty easy to take it and translate it. And it was a lot of work behind the scenes, but I thought that our virtual version really did have a lot of value. Um, and we had more people there than we've ever had at an in-person conference, um, even though we shut down and we reached 200 tickets and then stopped it because I was telling you earlier, Josh, I wasn't sure how it was gonna go and I wanted to fail in front of 200 people instead of 400. So um, 
But the really cool thing that I thought had tremendous value is that there were people there from all over the country, people there from all over the world. We had people from Nigeria and India. Um, so it was really cool that all these people who had probably, you know, heard us talking about the conference or followed Barrel House on Twitter and had seen literally 10,000 tweets about the conference, but just weren't in a position to go, they were able to be there. And I think it was a really valuable experience um, because again, like we kind of kept our same footprint of, you know, sessions and workshops um, and a, a really great kind of featured author reading that I thought was probably the best one we've ever had that Ty moderated for us. Um, but it, I thought it really did have a lot of value. And I think it's actually something that we're going to continue at least through Next year, we'll probably have, um, ideally, we'll have an in-person conference in Pittsburgh, a virtual conference in the winter, and then an in-person conference in uh, D.C. again, um, because we were really thrilled that so many people that weren't able to attend the, the in-person one for any reason, you know, the accessibility, um, you know, just not being able to take the time to drive or, you know, I, people who live on the West Coast or Midwest just weren't able to attend and, and they were. So I, I think that in that way, it's, it was like a lot of things in the pandemic where um, once you realize how easy it is to do something virtually, you can see like, oh, wow, that's maybe we should have been doing a version of this all along. It was kind of crazy that we never thought of this option before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and a lot of people are saying this in the chat. I'll, I'll weigh in as well. And that, that the conference was very good. The conversations and, and uh, connections. Oh, thank you. It was a very good conference. Um, and Tyrese, I want to hear your take as well, because you've, you've done virtual events now. You've done in-person events. What's your take on the difference between the two? So I, I think they both have their, um, their pros and cons. Um, the pros for virtual conferences is that, like Dave said, you can have anyone from any part of the world join in as long as it, you know, works with their schedule. And I love the accessibility of that. Like, I love the fact that that we aren't, um, you know, restricted to the the parameters of a physical space that would then, you know, allow a lot of our um, community to not be able to attend. You know, um, a lot of times these conferences take place um, in old buildings or universities that aren't um, as accessible for, for folks. So I, I think having virtual conferences really opens the door to allow everyone um, the ability to access them. Especially when, and you know, and I feel like virtual conferences and virtual literary events are also financially um, much more accessible as well. I've noticed that the, the fees associated with a lot of these events have gone down because the overhead associated with doing something virtual versus doing something in person is vastly different. So people are not also being able to access these, um, you know, where, where, you know, the financial aspect of it kind of kept them from being able to be involved. Now they can find, if they can't go to that particular conference still, they can still find something else that might be, you know, within their um, affordability range or, um, you know, something that can stand in. There's, there's so many more options available now because of the virtual environment than there were before. And I think that that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I do think though, that there is something to be said for having people around one another, that vibe and energy, um, the, there is, it's almost, um, I don't know, I don't wanna say impossible, but it's very difficult to connect with people virtually in the same way. Um, it's hard to connect uh, to network. Um, and as much as, you know, writers are, tend to be sort of introverts and, you know, sometimes very like in their own sort of groups, um, at in-person conferences, um, you know, there are events that kind of put us together 
and allow us to get outside of our, you know, sort of um, social bubble so that we can network and, and meet up and make friends and things like that. So, so those are the things that I, I miss about in-person conferences. I hope that in the future, we kind of stick with sort of this mix, mix and match, like, where there are some that are online where we can, you know, open up like we are now, and then some that go back to being um, in person. I would really like my sole desire right now is to like go to on a spring day an outdoor um, conference or festival or something where there's like panels and it's like in an open field. I don't know where we're having this, but this is what I want. <laughs> um, and like, you know, like a dance party at the end of the night, like that's what I want. <laughs> um, but, and so hopefully we can go back there at some point. Mm -hmm. So then last question before we move on to retreats, but Dave, there are so many conferences out there. So, so what is it that Barrel House, that your conference brings to the table? Why, why should they choose your conference? I think, well, if you're in DC or Pittsburgh, we're probably going to be back in DC and Pittsburgh. I think that um, it's a really good value because we have uh, four featured books and also literary magazine subscriptions included in your, in your registration. Um, and I think the virtual conference, I think it was $75 was the registration. And people actually got two books and a literary magazine. Um, at the in-person conference, we also have the option to do a one-on-one -on -one meeting with an editor, which we call speed dating with editors, um, where you sit down and hand that person either a flash prose piece or a couple poems or the first couple pages of a longer thing and then you get direct, immediate feedback from, from a, an editor, literary magazine, or small press. So that's something that people really, you know, I'll say 80% of people love it. 20% of the people hate it, <laughs> have a really weird experience. Because <laughs> it is, it, you know, it's a little charged when you're sitting there, someone is giving you direct feedback in real time on your work. Uh, but most people tend to really like it. Um, we've had work accepted on the spot. Sometimes uh, we've had people say in their evaluations, this is the first time I ever thought of editors as people, the you know, actual person over there on the other side of the table. So I think that those kind of experiences are a good, um, a good value. And also, like I said, we really try to set a welcoming tone and make sure people at kind of all levels of experience feel very comfortable. Um, and that's, I, I think one thing you can find out at our conference and most conferences, if you actually kind of take some time and talk to people, is there are more people like, like me and Ty who are working full-time jobs, have families, are writing when we can, and still kind of having some measure of success, at least in, in putting work out there. Um, that's one of the things we always try to get across. And I know we talked about that in the, the featured author um, actually, I asked you that question, Ty, at the virtual conference. So I think that's, that's one thing that we always try to make sure gets across that not everyone is Stuart O'Nan, you know, putting out one book a year. There's many more of us who are working regular jobs, taking care of our kids, doing whatever else we have to do and, and trying to squeeze in enough writing time to, you know, get 200, 400, 500 words down a day. And I think that 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 tends to come through at our conference because it's something we really want to cultivate. Mm -hmm. Tyrese, are there any conferences you've gone to that you feel like rise above the pile? Oh, rise above the pile. Um, that's a really good question. I think I found um, value in pretty much every conference that I've gone to. I, I think, like I said, I think it's more so just what you're looking for at the time. Um, I've gone to conferences that felt really like down to earth, like the Barrel House Conference, and then conferences that felt really super, um, almost like you're in like a work professional kind of conference setting, like almost like you're at a trade kind of conference. Um, and so I think it really depends on what you are, um, also your personality too. 
because while I, you know, I feel like Barrel House's demographic is, um, they're a lot more down to earth. The folks that go there are a lot more down to earth. Um, sometimes they are also people who are it currently in like their MFA or emerging. Um, and so sometimes, even though the age range is vast, you'll find a lot more younger people, I think, in the audience. I went to um, the Grub Street Conference in Boston and that felt like, you know, there were people dressed up like they were going to work, <laughs> um, you know, wearing a uh, very professional attire. Uh, it was in this like very grand hotel in Boston. Um, and we got breakfast every morning, uh, lunch every day. Um, and the, I would say the demographics of the folks who were there were a lot old, not a lot older. I mean, granted, I'm, you know, but they weren't, um, you know, MFA age folks. They were like probably in their 30s, 40s, 50s, you know. Um, but it all felt like at both conferences, the individuals who were there were in the same sort of place professionally, if that makes sense. So everyone was still still learning about craft, still learning about publishing, still learning about um, you know how to write and promote themselves and things like that. But it was but depending on sort of like um, also the price range for Grub Street was um, you know much more expensive. Um, so, so it really, it, it was a very different vibe between the two. And I think you as knowing who you are and your interests and, and um, sort of your, um, your own personal demographic, um, deciding on which one to go to is probably, you know, based on who you are and yourself. Um, also a really important thing for me that I learned is that I'm not suited to go to every single conference. Um, while I really enjoyed Grub, the Grub Street Conference, I did not enjoy Boston. So I think it really, you know, so now when I think about, you know, honestly going to Boston in general, that's something that I have to kind of consider. Do I want to, even though I really, really, really enjoyed the conference, do I want to go back to Boston? It's, it's, there are things that are, you know, outside of just going to the conference that you have to consider as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a question in the Q&A that I want to get to real quick about recommendations for specific conferences and where to find them. So I, I actually just wanted to point out uh, New Pages is a great website. Poets and Writers has a, a database. Uh, Writers Digest always does a conference roundup. So does the Writer Magazine. Um, so there's tons of, of websites out there where you can find the conference, uh, just a, a full breakdown of conferences. Um, all right. So I want to move on to retreats now, uh, talking about writing retreats. So um, Tyrese, I'll start with you here. Um, it's again, starting off similar to how we did with the conferences, but what do you see as the point of a writing retreat and how, how does that differ from a conference? Oh, writing retreat and conferences, they're completely different. <laughs> a retreat is where I am there to write. I probably would never, I mean, I don't even know if I've ever written anything while at a conference. Um, it's A conference is mostly, in my opinion, a place for me to learn. A retreat is a place for me to practice. Um, and so that's the, the major difference in my mind. Dave, what's, what's the point of a retreat, especially bringing in uh, Barrel House's writer camp? What's the point of it? What, why should people go? I agree with Ty. Um, I guess, first of all, a writer camp is a short retreat. So it's a, a short retreat, either three nights or four nights. We generally do two sessions each summer. We're actually currently I have a call with the, the person who runs the hostel where we have the retreat um, tomorrow with uh, Becky Barnard, who's our editor, who runs 
Greater Camp Forest, yeah. <laughs> so um, we're trying to figure out if we can do it this summer, but it's a, a three or four day retreat um, in kind of central Pennsylvania, about 15 minutes from where I am right now in State College. And um, all the food is taken care of. So the, the place where we have it is this, this hostel that this guy built along a creek in central Pennsylvania to model these places he stays at when he goes on surfing trips in South America. So um, it's along a small creek in Pennsylvania and not a big, beautiful ocean. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. Um, they, they make all our meals for us. They make a campfire at night. So, um, you know, as, as again, a person who has a full-time job and a family, um, to me, the, the wonderful thing about that retreat and, and other retreats is just having time to spend just on my writing or on reading or on hanging out. And I, you know, I tend to do all those things. I try to do all those things when I go to even these short retreats, um, just to kind of recharge my batteries and have a couple days when there's nothing I have to worry about, um, literally, other than trying to get my own work done and get to know some other people who might be there. Um, so yeah, to me, it's really that blank space of time, which I literally never ever have in my real life. It's a chance to, to have that and to get kind of recharge my batteries and, and come back feeling like, um, like, all right, I, I, now I can kind of get back to my usual chipping away 45 minutes here and a half an hour there. And, and Dave, is there a right time to go to a retreat? Like, do you have to have a certain experience as a writer or can anyone go? I think anyone can go. I know for ours, um, we have an application process. Um, it's really just to try to make sure basically to weed out any potential jerks, I would say. Um, but no, I think anybody, you probably want to be in a fairly serious place with your writing, like a, a retreat probably would have sounded great to me when I was 28, 28 and just starting out, but it may not have been the best, you know, I, I may not have been as well suited. Uh, right now, when I go, I have a project. Um, I kind of give myself, um, you know, I, I want to get this many words done per day. So I'll kind of go with a specific project in mind, probably also with some editing projects in mind and say, this is what I'm going to get done each day. And then I'm also going to go for a long walk or, you know, finish this book. Um, so I do think it, you know, for me, it works best when I have some specific thing in mind. I don't, I don't know that I could go, um, especially on a longer retreat, and just say, well, I'm going to work on whatever. I think the, the way my brain works now, kind of having such little time to work in general in terms of writing, that uh, my brain might just explode if I had like 14 days and not a specific thing to work on. I'd probably do nothing at all. So <laughs> I try to make sure I have some goals and, and you know, generally make them so they're pretty easy to meet. Too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, I try to put not too much pressure on myself, but just enough to be marginally productive. Terry, is it the same with you? Do you feel like you have to have a, a project in motion to go to a retreat? Um, I think it helps. Um, I feel like otherwise it would be, I don't want to say a waste of time because I don't think any time to yourself is a waste of time. But to be more productive, yes, I think having uh, an idea of something that you want to do, um, you know, would be helpful. Um, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be writing. It could be reading. And, you know, like Dave said, it could also be editing. Um, you know, I'm a parent and I work full time. And sometimes retreats are the only time that I get an opportunity to check my email. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I think it's, you know, it really, um, it is helpful to have a project, but it's not, you know, I, I also find that it's also a place where I get a lot of inspiration for new projects and new writing. Um, so, you know, don't feel like you have to be pigeon held into like something particular. Um, but I, I personally feel like it is helpful to have an idea of what I want to do when I show up. 
Yeah, I think for me, like if I'm going to take vacation from my job and kind of if I'm going to play that card here in my house, if I'm leaving for four days, I want to make sure it's relatively worthwhile. And Tyrese, correct me if I'm wrong, you were a writer in residence at, at the Barrel House Writer Camp, correct? I was, yes. And, and how was that? What was, the, what was the process like? What was gained? What was the whole, what's the idea behind being a writer in residence? Well, so I, it's a different ex- experience than just the typical person who is at writer's camp just to kind of use it as a writing retreat. So while I'm there, I'm almost, I'm not quite to the level of staff as like the Barrel House editors, you know, they're putting on the show, they're making sure things are running correctly. People are in the right rooms, nothing, you know, bad is happening. Um, But I am also not like the typical um, camp goer in that my entire time there is my own. Um, So I meet with uh, campers who are looking for some guidance on their work. And so they send to me, um, uh, you know, things that they have in drafts beforehand and then I read them. And uh, it's usually like two or three people. And I um, try and, um, you know, I'll have a meeting with them and I'll organize our time together. Uh, I try and schedule a time where we're all three meeting one another, meeting together to do something um, useful and and sort of uh, craft related together. And then I meet with them one on one to talk individually about the pieces that they sent me. So um, you know, it's very informal, and yet I think I think that the setting of the um, of writers camp as well as sort of the, you know, sort of feeling like you're a part of nature, you know, out in the, not really the wilderness, but like (laughs) almost like the wilderness, you know, like feeling like you're kind of there to commune with one another in a different way. I feel like that opens the senses to creativity. So when I try and meet with the people that I've been assigned to, um, a lot of the things that I will work on with them will focus around sort of connecting to, to themselves as well as connecting to their writing. So, um, so yeah, so it's a balance. And then I, and luckily because, you know, I'm in between uh, being a camper and being, you know, running the show, I still am able to, you know, have time to myself to do my own work and write and things like that um, and read. So um, I don't know, I, I find it to be uh, very enjoyable, I, you know, because I get to like sort of keep my mind processing in like the practical sense, but also I'm working creatively as well. So I enjoy it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody has the option to, to workshop two pieces with a editor or um, visiting writer. So, um, that's literally the only kind of program that we have. We're pretty anti-program and just the rest of the time is yours to do whatever you want. So I want to start pulling in some questions from Q&A now just to make sure we get to all of them. Um, so first one, I'll pose it to both of you. Dave, we'll start with you. How do you prepare for a retreat? It seems difficult to suddenly have the pressure to produce for so many hours straight. I, like I said, I try to put low expectations on myself, um, but kind of marginal expectations. Um, I try to do, like I said, a word count and try to have a specific project. Uh, I was just on a retreat not long ago um, and kind of said, I want to do 25 words a day, 2,500 words a day on this novel in progress. And I just want to keep on moving forward. And I also had a kind of a manuscript for a chat book that I wanted to read. Um, And I wanted to go for a long walk every day. Um, So for me, again, if I'm going to be taking, you know, literally using my vacation, you know, putting my partner in a position where she's kind of running the house here, we do have a son. um, I want to make sure I get something out of it. So I try to do just have some goals, but not, not make them so hard that I'm going to get frozen on the first day and just get 
nothing done or, or come back from this time that's supposed to be kind of relaxing and recharging and feel like I failed. <laughs> so I think I, I generally try to put very little pressure on myself, um, but try to be a little prepared about what my plan is going in. Mm-hmm. Tyrese, what about you? How do you prepare for a retreat? Um, I think I sort of kind of take stock of what I need to do. Um, I have a book that I, I'm supposed to be working on, so I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I kind of uh, put the things in my bag that I feel like I could use to kind of help um, work on that particular project. Um, so that's how I prepare. I think a, a, another question, and I don't know if this is in the Q&A or not, but um, a related question is how do you um, create a retreat? Because sometimes retreats, you know, you can do a, a retreat that isn't something formal or put together by someone else. Like you can make your own retreat. So you can go to, you know, a way that I can prepare for my own retreat is to book an Airbnb for a weekend. And that's my, that's my retreat. That's me preparing for a retreat. I'm going to an Airbnb, maybe lo- close by um, just for the weekend. I'm going to take a book or just my laptop or something. And that is my preparation for a retreat. I think it's very low key. Um, that's what I really enjoy about retreats in general is that there's so much more freedom. Yeah. And I've done that before too. Just had people come here to my house, um, said, all right, you know, my wife and son go away for the weekend to her parents' house or whatever. And we say, all right, from Friday through Sunday, you know, we're going to write during the day and hang out at night. Um, and it's pretty much a, you know, no cost retreat. So yeah, I I was going to say the same thing that you can, you can make this happen or just say, I'm going to a hotel for a couple of days and I'm trying to get this done or mm-hmm. going wherever. Yeah. Speaking of costs, we are getting some questions about costs. So next, next question, Dave, I think we'll start with you again on this. Retreats often cost a lot of money. Do you feel there is a break point where the cost outweighs the benefits? I think that's definitely a personal question. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're all kind of all over the place in terms of costs. I'm actually pulling up Raider Camp website right now to, to look at what our retreat costs. So ours is $500 for the three night camp and 600 for the four night camp. And I can tell you that we make some of that. Most of that goes to the hostel um, because they are preparing every single meal for us. So a lot of that just goes into the meal costs. Um, and it might be unique that we do have that option to provide every single meal. Um, but it's definitely a personal choice. And, and I think you'd have to weigh that idea of like, do I just go to a hotel room or send my partner away for the weekend? Um, can I get that same kind of thing? We always have a, a pretty large percentage, maybe one third of the people at camp who are parents who are there specifically um, to get away from their family and really try to work on something for three or four days. Um, I think that that length of time seems to work for parents. It works for me as a parent. Um, so yeah. And, and I know there are lots of other ones that are more expensive, but also provide more programming. Um, so that's another thing to consider, you know, if you were to go to the tin house, um, I think there's called a workshop rather than a retreat, but I think it's kind of a combination of both and kind of a conference too. Like, I think that would be more expensive, but also would give you a much more programming and a much, much more of kind of a schedule and a chance to meet a larger number of people. So I think that it's really a really personal thing, depending on um, your own situation. Tyrese, anything to add to that? No, I think that the, that is, probably more important for the person to decide what they need before they start looking at retreats or conferences. One of, you know, like Dave said, one of the things we didn't talk about were workshops, which are different 
um, things as well. So, um, you know, figure out what you need and then decide sort of which way to look. Um, because if you do need programming, um, then you want to find something that has a little bit more of, of, of those things involved. If you just need a place to go for time away, then you can, uh, you know, figure out that as well. And I, you know, and I think cost is, um, cost is something that if you are looking in the right places, um, you might can find a, a place that has a scholarship or, um, you know, a fellowship or something that will pay for those things for you. So, um, you know, try and look at, you know, fellowship pages, like you said, new pages, um, poets and writers. There are places that you can go to search for the ability to attend conferences and retreats and workshops where you get a scholarship mm -hmm. and that will help. Next question, Tyrese, let's start with you on this one. Any tips for first timers for networking with other attendees before a conference? Oh, before a conference. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I, um, one of the ways that I met uh, Nafisa Thompson Spears was that we were both a part of a Facebook group and we were both going to the 10 house workshop. And I think I either, uh, either she, one of us posted in that Facebook group, anyone going to 10 house, let's hang out. <laughs> so that, and so, so when, so we connected on Facebook and we exchanged phone numbers and we just like stuck together once we got there and everything was fantastic. So I think um, if you are part of any social media, um, you can just tweet or post in a, a Facebook group or, or something um, and say, hey, I'm going to be at X conference next week. Anybody going? Anyone want to have lunch? Whatever. Um, another way, I think, to um, pre-network is, especially at... Um, AWP is to, um, or any type of conference that's like that, that has outside activities, look and see like sort of what journal, whatever journals or whatever presses or people that you like, look to see who um, is having like a, an event during that week. And it may not necessarily be pre-networking, but it's sort of like your ability to plan your networking once you get there. So like, if you wanna go to a smoke house, a smoke long um, quarterly reading, you know, you can look up when their readings are gonna be and then just, you know, kind of go. I personally would probably try and get there a little early so I can have a conversation with, you know, whoever's kind of sitting around um, and also is there early to kind of, you know, get a conversation going, things like that. So, um, Part of it is just kind of like doing your research. And then part of it is just kind of putting yourself out there on social media and saying, hey, I'm going to be here. Anybody want to have lunch? You know? Mm -hmm. Dave, anything to add? No, I think that's really good. That's a really good answer. Um, I, <laughs> I think Twitter is good for this kind of thing. Um, I always tell my, when I do online workshops, I'd recommend that they follow literary magazines, especially on Twitter and writers they like. Um, Things like our conference or writer camp or the Tin House conference, um, you're you're likely to hear about things like that on Twitter, and you're likely to be able to interact with people speaking at, organizing, or or going to those places too. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, this one, Dave, I'll just pose it to you. Are there are there volunteer opportunities at the Barrel House conference? There are. Yeah. Um, I should say we're all volunteers. None of us get paid uh, who run Barrel House. So <laughs> that's the reason we, one of the big reasons we still exist. Um, but yeah, we do, um, we do have volunteer opportunities both in person and um, on the virtual conference. And um, this time around for the virtual conference, I think we just had folks who we knew really, I think it was mostly people that we met at the in-person, various in-person conferences and got to know um, 
actually, you know, over the course of a couple of years who reached out and said, Hey, I'd love to volunteer for this. Um, if there's any opportunity. So, um, that, that is something that's, I'm always as a conference organizer, very receptive to when someone reaches out and says, Hey, I'd, I'd, I'd love to attend the conference, but I can't afford it. Is, are there any volunteer opportunities or just, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm into what you're doing. Is there anything we can do? And I think, I don't know what percentage, but a, a percentage of our assistant editors right now are people that we met either at the conference or who reached out in that way to say, Hey, I'm, I'd love to be there. And can I help out at all? Um, so that's also a good way to kind of network in a very organic and helpful way um, and start to build an actual relationship. So let's sneak one more question in here before we, before we finalize today. Um, let's ask Dave. Dave, how many people go to what would be considered a big conference? So what do you see as the breakdown between how many people go to like AWP versus how many people go to the smaller conferences? Oh, I don't, I don't even know how big AW, AWP is. Um, it's thousands, right? Yeah. Um, it's really big. Actually, I think there, there were years when it got up to something like 10,000. And mm -hmm. I know that they had to make a decision that they could only hold it in um, conference centers and couldn't do it in hotels anymore. So that's a really big one. Ours uh, tends to be, uh, the virtual conference was 200, but again, I, I cut it off because I was afraid to fail in front of more people than that. Um, and in person, we tend to have about 175, 180, up to like 200 in DC. And in Pittsburgh, it's more like 100 or 120. So a little more intimate in Pittsburgh. Um, DC actually feels pretty full in the spaces that we're in. Um, 200 people feels like uh, about as many as we would want kind of for the space that we have. Um, but we also rely on donated space. So George Mason University in DC and Chatham University in Pittsburgh, um, just they host us for free. So um, we are kind of limited in the space that we have and, and what we would be smart to do with that space. Tyrese, how many people go to uh, Muse in the Marketplace when you went? Was it, did it feel like too many people or was it too big? Um, I, I think there was probably like 300 people there. Um, it didn't feel too big. It felt like just the right size. Um, uh, and I, I think it felt, um, it felt very, uh, in the rooms that we were in for the panels, it, it was snug. So... Um, so it was a good size. Mm -hmm. So very last thing I want to do is give you both a chance. If you have something to promote a book or, or an event, something that you want to tell people about or how to connect with you on social media, this is your chance to do it. So Dave, let's start with you. Do you got anything, anything to promote? Um, actually, I'll just say if folks are interested in Barrel House, our website is barrelhousemag.com. Um, our Twitter is at Barrel House. That's the best way to follow anything we do. And um, we are hoping that we'll be able to hold our Pittsburgh conference in person in the fall. Usually that's the third week in October. It'll be 100% dictated by Chatham University and what their policy is in October. Um, and probably we'll have the virtual conference again sometime around January and then hopefully in DC in person again in April. Mm -hmm. Tyrese, how about you? Anything to promote? Uh, just how to sit. Um, I don't have anything new to promote. Um, but you know, I, you can follow me on Twitter at Ty Lachelle Co. Um, and yeah, that's it. Awesome. Dave, Tyrese, thank you both so much for being here to our listeners. We'll be back. We actually have a special episode tomorrow, um, about writing resources for the BIPOC community. So tune in for that. And then next week, we're going to be back, and I forgot what the, oh, uh, it's, we're going to be talking about publishing advances and what you can expect to be paid in publishing. So we'll see you then. Again, Dave, Tyrese, thank you both so much for being here today. Thanks, You're Josh. Welcome. Thanks, everybody. All right, we'll see you all later.